Hello and welcome to this presentation on the GCE A-Level Drama and Theatre Specification 9DRO. I'm Jacqueline Porteous, the Chief Examiner for the Specification and the Principal Examiner for Component 3. I've worked for Pearsons as an examiner for over 25 years and hopefully have lots of useful experience to share with you, particularly looking back on the recent 2023 series. Like many of you, I've attended courses and run courses, and I do understand how precious your time is. So as I go through each of the three components in order, you might find you want to stop and come back to relevant bits as and when you're teaching it. 2023 was the seventh year of examining this specification. So whether you're new to us or have taught it since it began in 2016, or indeed some of our legacy specifications, ideas and teaching methods need to be fresh, appropriate and tailored to your individual cohort, which might be quite different year on year. And it's certainly different to the school down the road from you. So I'll go through each of the three components. I will remind you or tell you of the available resources all from our website and then outline the most effective approaches we've seen in recent years that hopefully will lead to success for your students. And again, remember, success for your students might be an A star. It might be a C. It might be the fact that they've managed to pass the A level. So a good examination should return grades across the spectrum A star to E. This presentation is not a repeat of what is required for each component in terms of weightings, rubric, assessment objectives. All that's available and we've done many courses. It's in the ASG, it's in the specification. It's a summary of good practice that we've seen, particularly in 2023, with some examples and ideas that work and hopefully some new ideas for you to try out. You do need to be realistic. It is not possible for all students to gain top marks. If it was, it wouldn't be an examination. It's not how it's been built or structured in terms of a specification to return um, a range of all grades and to be accessible to a range of abilities. Uh, I don't say that flippantly, but if you do have students who don't actually want to perform or aren't able to apply skills to design elements, it really can be an uphill struggle. It's likely that for most of you, you're teaching a small group of students and you've perhaps seen the groups that you do teach at A-level decrease in number for a variety of reasons over the years. So it's capitalising on the things that they do bring to the course, to your classroom, to your studio and supporting them in the best possible way that you can to ensure that the work they're presenting is their own. So we'll start at the beginning with component one, um, the devised unit or the unit in which they devise a piece of theatre. The creation of an original devised performance supported by a portfolio. The first thing I would say to you is, is timing. Look at your school calendar. Don't put your performance on the same day at sports day or some other big school event that's going to pull your sixth formers away from this particular examined component. I'm talking particularly about the performance of this. We found most of our centres choose to complete this component towards the end of year 12. It's the only component that can be completed at a time of your choice. The only deadline is that it's all submitted by May the 15th in the final year of study. So you might decide to have a look at your school or college calendar and think again about when you do complete this component. If you don't already do this, I strongly recommend putting it into the school calendar. Make the performance for component one official. Make sure that the powers that be in your centre realise that your students are doing 40% of their examination now. And definitely give the date and the details of the performance of performances to your exams officer. So these are all things that at a departmental meeting, a faculty meeting, however you operate and do your planning, 
This can be done right at the start of the year, the time of day, the venue, the audience, which I'll come back to in a little while, the camera operator, hugely, hugely important. It's the filmed evidence is examination evidence, and I will touch on that um, in component two as well. So getting the text extract right is in your gift. It will make a huge difference, and that is where you're going to start from. So the starting point is a stimulus that has to be an extract from a professionally produced text with a minimum running time of 60 minutes. The choice of this extract is yours and it is so important. Conventionally, a stimulus could be an issue, image, incident, something that invokes a reaction. Does your extract do this? Does the extract that you have selected from a text of your choice, with a couple of advisories, does it excite? Is it a springboard? Our principal moderator has used this word springboard in the report from 2023. And he's saying that it's got to catapult your students towards creating, devising an exciting piece of work. But that catapult, that springboard, also needs to be kept in sight at all times. Some students tell us that they chose the extract themselves. I would really, really advise against this. Their knowledge of performance text is minuscule compared to yours, and they can waste weeks just looking at scripts, arguing about it, starting the creative process with resentment, how many times lower down the school, if you've taught younger students, have they set off with great gusto on something and then abandoned it? You haven't got time to do that. The choice of the text extract as the springboard is within your gift. And I think it's incumbent upon us to produce something that supports our students get off to a flying start on this component. Again, I do urge you to look at the examiner's report from 2023. There's lots of really good advice from the principal moderator about how the exploration of this specific moment has shaped, developed and influenced the early stages of the devising process. The worst examples we've perhaps seen that really haven't supported them to a flying start is where candidates have chosen the extract or it's just been very vague. We're using such and such a text, take the key images or issues from it and go forward with that. Um, some candidates even struggle to reference what the specific extract is. So in contrast, candidates who've analysed, considered how the ideas of a specific moment have developed that really contributes to the early stages of their devising journey. For example, one centre focused on the final moment from Brecht's Caucasian Chalk Circle, and this led to various discussions about adoption law, motherhood, parenting. Another centre explored the disclosure made in the opening scene from Orphans by Dennis Kelly. This provoked a discussion into how personal trauma affects people differently. So they're the kind of examples you'll find in the examiner's report. The key to it is a specific extract. It has to play out for about 10 minutes. Again, the detail, the rubric is in plenty of other places, but that's the experience that we found, particularly in 2023. As with any examination, there are rules that need to be followed. Um, be sure that your students know the rules, they know, know the rubric, they know what they can and can't do, and they stick to it. So things like timings, word counts for the portfolio, group numbers, all these things matter. And it's just getting across to them that it is an exam and it isn't OK to perhaps do this or add an extra person in or whatever that they want to do. It's often done with the best creative artistic intentions, but it doesn't meet the criteria required for this component. The performance itself, um, performers and or designers all need to be equally involved. So, um, you know, support your students in doing that. Most students are performers, but there are designers. 
often lighting and costume, but some may choose sound and set. And we're very aware as I record this that some of you have requested that puppets are included as a design element because that's very popular um, use of puppetry in the theatre at the moment. And we are looking into that. But until it comes through the newsletter or it is on our website as official, puppets at the moment don't count, but we are working to see if we are able to include them. Um, designers also need to submit additional documentation and everything to support them. Their examination evidence is all uploaded to the LWT. Choice of audience. Don't leave your audience to chance. Again, think carefully about the time of day. Are you going to do this in the, the school day? In which case you've got those issues of bells and classrooms moving and noise and things in terms of recording it. But quite often you've got an audience, might be um, a GCSE class, who would be an appropriate audience to come and watch the piece when you record it. Or it might not be. An appropriate audience. If you're going to do it in the evening and you have an audience of friends and family, is that an appropriate audience for the piece? It needs to fully support the work of your candidates so that you are filming them and submitting that work that shows them in their best possible light. Um, if you are going to do it outside the timetable day, you need to be happy with that. And again, it's still an examination. It needs to go into the school calendar and be scheduled as such. But essentially, do what's best for you and your students. Recording it, I cannot emphasise enough the importance of recording a performance. If the moderator is watching all that work that your students have poured into that performance and it's bleached out, it's grainy, it can't be heard properly. Um, half the stage is not caught on camera, so some students aren't seen properly. All those kind of blips really, really matter because the exam ev evidence isn't good enough. So again, I urge you, I think it's on page 77 in the specification, best practice on recording a performance. Who's going to do it? Is the camera booked? All those kinds of things. It really does matter. Um, quick list here of common problems of elements that made moderation more difficult. In other words, it's compromising the work that you and your students have produced for 40% of the examination. Uh, candidate introductions took place out of costume. That can be really difficult, particularly if they're in school uniform, which a lot of sixth formers still are, or even if they're in their own clothes. Um, it's not their costume. So moderators are often looking at the performance and they'll write down, you know, green trousers or whatever. And then that candidate that they think is wearing green trousers, when it comes to start, that's not what they're wearing anymore. We've mentioned time and again, candidates dressed in all black or similar costumes with very little offered in terms of visual differentiation. You're, you know them. You could tell one twin from another twin, for example. But when you're looking at something on video, on your screen, it really has to be crystal clear who's who, which candidate is which. Bleaching, it's really difficult bleaching, all to do with lighting and camera levels and things. Take some advice on it. Um, see if you can do practice pieces that can try and eliminate the bleaching. And if the worst comes to the worst, you may need to alter the lights, get a better camera or whatever in order to best support the, the final outcome of the piece. Music and sound levels, overpowering dialogue, audience members obscuring the view of the camera. That happens such a lot. And um, the camera's perhaps put halfway back down an aisle because you've got the whole piece in and you've set that up. Your audience then come in and suddenly you've got a sea of heads. So the bottom third of the screen that the moderator is looking at in order to support the marks that you've awarded, a great deal of the action is missed. Camera being placed at one side of the performance space very, very rarely works. Similarly, too far away. And quite often, you might sit at an exam desk almost as if it's your component two performance, 
but you're sat right in front of the camera and blocking the view. Non-assessed individuals, this has become increasingly a common, particularly because some centres numbers have really, really dropped. So you would only use a non-assessed individual when you haven't got three candidates entered for the exam, because minimum group size is three. What we have found quite a lot is people have filmed it at the end of year 12. I've already said that's when most people tend to do it. And then for whatever reason, one of the students that was in the year 12 group as a genuine candidate doesn't come back into year 13 or drops the subject or whatever. That's unavoidable. You wouldn't have to redo the whole piece because that had happened, but you still then have, when you're submitting examination evidence in May, a non-assessed individual. So you'd need written permission from drama assessment, whatever the circumstances. There should be no reason why there's anybody within the group piece um, that isn't a candidate that's entered for the examination. Don't underestimate the weightings for this particular component. 20 marks for the performance, 60 for the portfolio. The portfolio is worth three times the amount of the performance, but I wonder how many of us have spent three times the amount of time on the portfolio compared to the performance. Again, perhaps worth putting up on the wall, constantly reminding your students not to neglect the portfolio, not to leave it till it's written retrospectively, all those kinds of good practice elements. Just in terms of the weightings, a third of the time should be going into the portfolio. In particular slide, I've taken the statements that have to be addressed and just rejig them slightly, but you'll see they're saying the same thing. So you're teaching your students how to respond to an extract, track the development journey, connect research to key stages and outcomes, evaluate roles from start to finish, analyse contribution, practitioner influences, the impact of live theatre they have seen. Discuss social, cultural and historical conventions and evaluate the success of their creative choices. So I've just worded the statements according to the skills you need to teach them. But again, particularly from the principal moderator and from me, we really urge you to use the statements. It makes your life so much easier if the statements are used. Otherwise, it's incumbent upon you as the teacher assessor to show the moderator where the relevant sections are buried within a portfolio. If you've used the statements, it's crystal clear to see that each one of those has been addressed. They don't have to be done in consecutive order. Um, it's, a, it's a working document and they'll find that they can do different bits at different stages. But again, it really does pay to use the statements and to leave them in the portfolio. Uh, JCQ guidelines regarding um, non-examined assessment, you have to mark the work and support your marks with written comments. There are detailed guidelines for admin marking standardisation on our website. It is in the ASG and in the examiner's report. but. What we've seen is quite a lot of portfolios, the very absolute majority are word processed and they're either annotated at the sides by the teachers, absolutely fine to hand annotate them, hand mark them. Um, more and more are using a sort of tracking column down the side which can be equally useful as well. It's up to you how you're going to do it, but again, you've marked it so you need to support the work and show us how you've arrived at those particular marks. There are also forms that need to be completed and signed before uploading to the LWT, including the CIS form. Now you'll be very pleased to know um, that our new subject officer, David Huston, has worked wonders with all the forms this year. They really are stable, they really do work. So again, make sure that you're doing the correct administration. Um, my suggestion to you is that if you enlarged and wall mounted these 16 bullet points, it would make the perfect checklist for you and your students. 
because you're doing the admin, they're doing the work. So there has to be some responsibility for them at this age and stage in their school careers. And finally for component one, um, resources on our website. We've never produced as many resources as are there currently and we keep adding to them. So you may well find things that were put there four or five years ago seem a little dated now. Um, I would also say, you know, read the, the most recent exemplars, the most recent materials, but there's lots there. There's a really, really helpful guide to devising. Again, lots of centres run that off and they give it to their students so that they're saying, you know, this is like a little booklet. This is how you devise. There are four component one training packs. There are exemplars for costume set, lighting and sound, all with the commentary from the principal moderator. We've got FAQs, the admin support guide, schemes of work, examiner's reports. I can't emphasize enough value of examiner's reports. They're quite extensive documents that all principals write at the end of the exam saying how it went this year. And while 90% of it in terms of the procedures is the same as the previous year, there are always interesting things that have arisen um, in, in the last 12 months. We've got Ask the Expert where you would put your question through and that can be a direct line to the principal moderator, also one of our experts who will get back to you. And then of course we've got Paul Webster who is um, always on hand, always available. You can book 10 minute appointments with Paul, but he will go out of his way to support you and to support centres. Um, and if it's anything subject specific, we will consult about particular issues. So it's time consuming, but sometimes just drilling down into the depth and detail of any one of these things um, might be a real help to you and to your students. Component two, text in performance. This is commonly referred to as the practical component, very often the most popular. In a nutshell, it's a monologue or duologue. It's also a group piece. Students are a performer or a designer. That's it. If only it were that simple. There are rules to follow because it's an examination first and foremost. And in many ways, it's the component where it's very easy to become a runaway train. And it has to be done. It will be done in the spring term of 2024. So the timings on this are very important. Again, now is the time to look at school calendar. Put your provisional performance dates into the whole school calendar as soon as possible at a time to suit you and be sure to call it an exam. Um, I'm sure colleagues don't mean to do it in our centres, but they don't always appreciate the significance that a drama performance, if it's for component two, it is an examination. So decide on the time of day, the venue, the audience, and make sure you've got the right person operating the camera. Um, You'll be very pleased to know that the exam window for this component is um, being extended compared to last year's. Centres examiners were all consulted as to the best time to complete component two. So in 2024, we are running from Monday the 8th of January until Friday the 19th of April. This is all in the ASG. It's all in new resources that are published on our website. So if you're listening to this and haven't decided yet on some provisional dates, I urge you to do that and to have some provisionally put into the calendar. But moving on from that, the text choice is in your gift. And it's really important, again, that you're choosing the right texts for your candidates, for your cohort. So before you actually get into the rehearsal room, Inform Pearson that, via the link on our website of your text choices. Now it says a minimum of six weeks before the exam, but in actual fact that link is live now. So if you've already decided I'm going to do text A and text B, 
for component two, you could actually submit that now. From November, ensure your exams officer makes provisional entries from November. We don't know you're doing this exam until you've entered some candidates. We do know if you did it last year, because that will show up on the, on the database, but until you've actually made some provisional entries, we can't get an examiner to you. And some of you might be wanting to do that exam in January, for example. So it's really, really important. Um, we've never sort of made enough of the fact that you need to get your candidates entered. And of course, for many, many subjects, they're not doing their exam until June 2024. So it doesn't matter that the entries aren't submitted until the February-March window. If you're wanting to be examined in the January-February, you've got to have your entries count. Put several days into your centre calendar, so you've got options when you agree a date with your visiting examiner. And this year, the intention is that you will be contacted in December. So in December 2023, you should be contacted by your, by your visiting examiner and you need to have some details at your fingertips. Um, they tend to contact you by email, but let people know you're expecting them. Tell the receptionist who might be getting a phone call. Certainly let your exams officer know that you're expecting to be contacted by somebody from Pearson and it's... The sooner you get back to them, the more likely you and your centre are to get your first choice and your dates that you'd like. Digital or live? Any centre wishing to complete component two between the 8th and the 31st of January, you will have to have the work assessed via recording. You can do it from the 8th to the 31st of January. You're obviously going to film it, you're filming it regardless, but you won't have a visit. No visits will take place in January. They must make exam entries by the 31st of January. Um, part of the reason for that is, is that the LWT doesn't open until the end of January. It is something that we've looked at long and hard. Um, but as soon as we're into February, from February the 1st, you can have a visiting examiner. So it's entirely up to you. And all our centres, both home and international, UK and international, have the option of a visit or a recording. And you can still do a recording in February, March and April. But if you want a visiting examiner to come to your centre, that's going to be February, March and up to the 19th of April. Use the most recent forms. These have all been updated. If you see on the um, yellowy one in the middle, that was updated on the 6th of September and this recording is being made in September. So the Candidate Centre Information Sheet, the CIS as it's sort of been abbreviated to, that's the particular form I mentioned earlier. It's been completely reworked so that it's user friendly. It isn't tiny anymore. It isn't huge anymore. It actually does what it's meant to do. Um, that's true for both components. So that's such a useful, useful document. It has to go up onto the LWT when you put all your other examination evidence on. I said I wasn't going to get too involved um, in rubric here. Um, read the ASG, consider giving a, a copy of it to your students so they're also aware that this is an examination and it has rules and it has guidelines. That's very important. Again, I've just said that. Be sure your students know the rules and they stick to it. So again, exactly the same for component one, same slide. There are timings that have to be met, minimum timings, maximum timings. Word counts, for component two, the word count is just for the statement of intention. Um, so it's less critical, but nevertheless, there is a limit on it. Group numbers are very important. All these things matter. It is an examination. It's a lot to think about. Um, if you think about the logistics of conducting a live exam, possibly with parents and friends there, you quickly realise how complicated it could be. 
So although I'm not going to go through all this detail, whether you're new hands, old hands, I do urge you to read the rubric carefully and make sure that you're still getting it right. Text choices. The texts you choose for your own students are critical to their success with this particular component. Um, when you've calculated the permutations way group numbers, group sizes, so you may not have that luxury, you just got one group and that's one group are going to be doing the group piece or whatever. Um, but whatever you're choosing, choose carefully. I would advise strongly against letting them choose the text. They know a fraction of what you know and they'll just waste hours deciding and quite often we'll be choosing texts that don't suit them, that don't show them in their possi best possible light. We've all done that, I've certainly done that, I've been you know, almost on the day of performance, too late to go back and bitter regretted my text choice with candidates or with students. But in the main, if you have sufficient time and thought and perhaps try out a few little bits with them, um, success is a lot to do with the choice of text with this. Um, we've got a list of suitable texts for this compo component and there are over a thousand different texts listed. Texts that are suitable. If you're using one of the texts from that list, it is acceptable. Don't let your students work on texts that will result in zero marks because text choices are only free choice up to a point. They must not use any of the texts on the list for component three. So that's the six texts for section B, the nine texts for section C, those 15 texts cannot be used for component two, irrespective of whether you're using them or not when you come to the written examination. So if they were putting on, I'll say, I don't know, Antigone, Hedda, Colder Than Here, any of those texts, they would get zero marks for it. So that would be a disaster. It can't be an unpublished script. It can't be a script of less than 60 minutes. Monologues, they're the worst. We see so many, not so many, that's an exaggeration. We see too many monologues that have been found on the internet. They're randomly written and they don't have the context from a complete play. So they're missing, even in that two or three minutes, they're missing all that prior knowledge or knowing what's going to come after. Uh, direct address, again, a vexed issue. An awful lot of candidates think, I'm on the stage, I'm doing my monologue, and I'm going to play it out to the audience and play it out to the camera. Unless that is exactly as it would be done within that play at that moment, direct address is absolutely inappropriate. It's not within the context of the play. So, We've got quite a, a strong statement in various bits of accompanying paperwork for Component 2 about direct address. So that's one to really have a look at. And similarly, they can't deviate at all from the text as published. Part of the test of this examination is that they can use a text and stay word perfect, faithful to it as published. So resources on our website for Component 2. Guide to interpreting text, training packs, that list of over a thousand text suggestions. Um, there are some examplars from 2021 performances with a commentary from the principal examiner. Um, it's slightly tricky putting examples of practical work up because of permissions. And there's a whole range of permissions needed from playwrights onwards to um, candidates' individual permission. We've got FAQs, the ASG again, and I think the most useful document, so it was put up there in March 2023, is a document called Preparing for Component 2, and that was done by our principal examiner. We've also got the reports, Ask the Expert, and of course, Paul Webster, if you have any questions, and I know he's really good at following those up. 
So they're the resources that are available to you. For many of your students, component two will be their favourite component. So this performance or design element is probably why they've chosen drama and theatre A-level. It's possibly the last practical work they will do with you while they're still at school or college. So it needs to be their very best work. It needs to be enjoyable, manageable, um, fit in with a very busy time in their lives when they're feeling under pressure from all their other subjects. So time management, choice of text and hard work are the key to success with this component. So finally on to component three, the written paper, formerly known as Theatre Makers in Practice. In essence, this is four questions on a written paper. So the candidates are using four different voices. They are responding as an informed member of an audience, as a performer, as a designer, and as a director. So four entirely different roles there that they are going to embody in response to each of the four questions. Logically, starting with section A, the live theatre evaluation. It is a requirement that they have to see live theatre. It is a requirement. Live theatre is the key word here. This was our unique selling point, our USP, when the specification was accredited in 2016. And of course, as drama teachers, we should be encouraging young people to be lifelong theatre goers, not just to go a minimum of once during their two year study on this course. Um, we also recognise a visit to see live theatre might just prove to be too difficult for a very small number of our centres. So if your students haven't managed this at any point during the two year course, you can apply for permission to use a digital performance. But I strongly urge you against this because there's nothing, nothing replicates being in the same room as the performers. There is more about this in the ASG on the website. But the JCQ, the Ofqual requirement is, is that this does happen and you will, um, there's a statement for you to sign or click whatever it is from the website to ensure that this requirement is met. And it's the live theatre performance submission form or something like that it's called. But again, if you're not able to do that, you do have to have um, written permission. So that's really important. I do understand that a lot of people say our students can't afford it. It isn't possible. We just can't get there. So as of now, September 2023 in London, if you're aged between 16 and 25, you can get tickets for less than £10 at any of these theatres. The National, the RSC, the Barbican, the Young Vic, the Donmar Warehouse have a small number of tickets that are free, which is absolutely incredible, as well as the five or ten pound um, tickets. And there will be lots of others. These were just some that I looked up um, very, very quickly. Outside London, Chichester Festival, five pounds, Mousetrap Theatre Projects, you just have to sign up for that. Um, cheap, cheap tickets to a whole range of productions. Sheffield Crucible Lyceum and Playhouse, £5 tickets, the Lowry in Manchester, the Royal Exchange, £7, Leeds Playhouse, 5 Liverpool Everyman, 5 There are plenty, there are others, you just have to ask. And at the end of the day, you've just got to be cheeky. You can set up your students, they are six formers, to, to literally go to the box office, explain they're doing drama and theatre A level, and just say, have you any returns? Can I wait? Have you any spare seats? 10 minutes before the curtain goes up, that kind of thing. But um, just trying to support you, to support your students to say, you can get to see live theatre. It doesn't have to cost a great deal. Musicals. If your candidates choose a musical and write about it, for section A and it is sung through, it will garner zero marks. And I can assure you that's heartbreaking for our examiners to give 
zero marks, as well as for your student or students. Um, there's no theatrical snobbery in this. I love a musical as much as the next person. But for this specification, which is called drama and theatre, the questions and indeed the assessment criteria that was written for a play where dialogue dominates. Um, so just make sure that they're seeing something that will count, particularly if they get to see very little and they haven't got a great um, depth of experience. Similar caution with dance pieces. Um, over the years, there's been some amazing pieces by companies like DV8 and others, but without any dialogue, it does make it very difficult for them to access. Um, the questions that are relevant to them. So think carefully what they see. Some productions really lend themselves to this section and others don't. Um, there are lots of recent examples given in the examiner's report and you can almost guarantee things that have done the rounds, um, Ocean at the End of the Lane, um, it's on the tip of my tongue, another one which we'll come back to in a minute. Things like that that have been round, you do see a lot of those, um, but that's absolutely relevant and right. They're, it's good quality theatre that's to the UK. Um, Frantic are a good example of a company that have done that. Um, it's not of mice and men. But anyhow, there's, a, there's another very good one that was based on a Steinbeck novel that's toured recently, and we read a lot of those. Um, in the 2023 responses. Um, the questions are designed to work with any production that a student may have seen. So you've got these broad sweep statements that they can agree, disagree, or come to some middle ground with. Another rubric, of course, for section A is that none of the set texts for B or C can be used at all for section A. Um, we have had a few this year where you can see when you pull through the whole paper that they might have, a centre might have, or a student might have used header garbler for section C, so the centre thinks it's fine that they've evaluated Antigone for section A. But of course, Antigone is also one of our set texts. It cannot be used. It's just easier to say that those 15 texts cannot be seen or used at all for section A even some sort of hybrid variants of them um, that are coming just avoid at all costs. So in a nutshell, they can't see production staged by others, they can't see a performance that's sung through in its entirety, they can't see a play that's on your bar set text licks. But if you're unsure, if you have a scintilla of doubt, please just check. Check with Paul Webster, check with Drama Assessment, check with Ask the Expert. Any one of those um, will get um, a knowledgeable response back to you. When we look at really strong responses for Section A, Live Theatre Evaluation, the thing that really makes a top level response stand out is evaluation. This is much more difficult to do than analysis. But it's evaluation that really, really makes all the difference. It needs to sound personal, it needs to be passionate, and it needs to be knowledgeable. And it's this that's most often missing from responses. So this particular example, this student saw a live production of Julius Caesar at the John Mar Wire House. This is um, their first example that they've given, and these are indicators as to why this is the start of a sophisticated response. So after the introduction, we're straight to an example with detail. The first example, which prompts me to agree that theatre makers have found the right balance between performers and designers was. So again, that putting back in the statement keeps them focused, it keeps it on track. Um, looking further down, you can see the set straight away. It's not just descriptive, there's personal comment. I found it affected, I found it particularly effective. Lots of analysis, this happened which meant this. We've got the names of theatre makers, 
So at the bottom, we've got played by Sheila Adam, playing a mel melancholic guitar melody, etc., etc. And I know these are just snapshots, but you can see here in two thirds of a page from what's probably a five or six page response that there's lots of depth and detail here. These are the things that we are looking for. So this example here, still um, the same production of Julius Caesar at the Don Mar. Um, reading the top line, the set and staging of this scene served to totally isolate Brutus. That's a fact, it's just a descriptive detail. So analysis comes um, when we hear about the impact of that. This was making him appear alone and vulnerable. Behind Brutus stood a large LED light strip which served to cast a dim shadow across his face, etc, etc. So you've got your design element there. It then goes on to talk about Harriet Walter who was playing Brutus. So you've got your performance element here, um, sat with a slumped posture, despondent facial expression, etc, etc. So this is what happened and this is the drilling into the detail. That's where you get the analysis, the impact of something. Middle of this um, particular response, a fusion, this fusion of set design and performance. So again, it's pulling in the statement in a different way and looking at the bottom of that, we get this personal element creeping in. This proved to me that theatre makers today really have found the right balance between design and performance with both elements complementing and balancing each other. I hope that says balancing. So again, it's keeping all these elements on the boil and threading them through the response. Finally, so this is probably towards the end of their response, the most effective moment of the production, which absolutely hammered home my belief that theatre makers have found the right balance, etc. So you can see that there's a pattern, there's a repetition of the statement that's blended through this particular response. We've got fine details about performance skills, followed by design details, and then there's some analysis. So it's... It, <laughs> This idea of a formula, a key moment, it's described, the details given, the design elements are given, the analysis is implicit, the evaluation runs through it. It is a recipe, if you like, for success. It really, really does work. And if you read the descriptor for a sophisticated response, this, this has it all, really. So we're looking at words like critical, perceptive, um, sophisticated analysis of performance elements, supported by precise knowledge and understanding, articulate use of subject-specific terminology, etc, etc. So it's this depth and detail and covering all the required elements that makes up a sophisticated response. Section B, page to stage, realising a performance text. Um, how I'm going to do this as a performer and how I'm going to do this as a designer. Same texts. There are the six texts that we use. Um, many, many of you, and I do understand why, have used the same text since the start of the specification and that may well be right for you. Um, you've obviously got all your resources and things in place. It might be worth sometimes looking at your cohort because they do change from year to year, particularly if you've got smaller numbers, the difference in your students can be more marked. Sometimes have a look at changing text just so it's fresher to you and often so it's more pertinent to them really. Um, of course, lots of you will say, well, I've got a mixed bag of students and they respond um, differently. But if you just think about the experience of working on Equus compared to working on Colder Than Here, it's huge. The difference between those two texts is, is enormous and some texts will suit your candidates better than others. Question three, of course, is always as a performer. We cannot emphasise enough that they are writing as that performer. So they're writing in the first person. Get your students to commit to the phrasing of this. 
I will be performing the role of Dysart, I will, or as Dysart, I will. And similarly, as a lighting designer, I want to do this with the lights, I would do that with the lights, so that they're really demonstrating that they understand the demands as a performer and the demands. So ironically, they're putting themselves in the role of a designer as well as a performer. We're going to look at some top level examples um, using the text across the two questions from the 2023 paper. So we've got um, accidental death, that phase and machinale for question three, accidental death, equus and machinale for question four to have a look at some examples. So the question was use of stage space. And again, exactly like the Julius Caesar element we've, um, example we've just looked at, the repetition of the statement, here we've got highlighted in yellow, the stage space. To use stage space, I would focus my use of levels. Um, increased volume, I would raise my hands, I would do this. And then the elements in pink are what they would actually do. So again, it's a bit of a formula, but it makes the point, um, this is, happens to be with accidental death, but the formula works with them all. It's what you would do as a performer. An example here from that face. So again, you can see as soon as I use the yellow to highlight, I would do this, I would do this, I would do this, I would swivel my way. And then examples of what they would do to show that they were using stage space. Um, so centre stage, bringing myself down stage to show um, the unpredictable urgency, side to side to create an uneven gait. This would create an uncontrolled, messy effect. Upstage centre, those things, they're just examples of subject-specific terminology. And um, upstage to show a lack of balance. I'm not saying that the other bits of writing here don't contribute to it overall. But when you've only got a short amount of time in an exam to do each of these questions, you've got to make it all count. There really isn't time for backfilling or waffle, as we might call it. An example from Machinal, much bigger writing here. Um, so as the actor playing lawyer for the defence, I deliver the line, I would walk briskly, um, I would be doing something with my arms. And the impact or the effect of that is, and again, it goes on in pink, I'm not going to read it all out. But you can see that even with this particularly large handwriting, lots of points need to be made and justified. Question four, it was either sound or lighting. So with this one, um, for accidental death, I would use lighting. This response cuts straight to the quick. An awful lot of them will spend half a page of, this is of lower um, scoring responses, this is what's happening in this particular scene. Well, we know what's happening in this particular scene. Tell us what you're going to do as a lighting designer. So I would have a cold front wash. I would also. So you really, they're just the phrases where they are the lighting designer. And then we've got the pink with a little bit of overlap. So it's changed to orange. But these are, this is what they do with the lights. They'd be a pale green backlight. They'd use practicals an overhanging bulb, desk lamps, practical lights, practicals, overhanging bulb again. So that's the lanterns or the lights that they would use. And in the limey green colour, this is the impact, this is the effect that it would have on this particular extract. Create it drab and bureaucratic, depth to the space, dingy quality, communicate how the police are in a spot, inhospitable, etc etc again i don't need to read it all out you can come back and have a look at it but even if your students aren't studying this particular text you could just give them this and show them in a short space of time an awful lot of ground has been covered 
In fact, as I'm looking at it now, there's bits I haven't even highlighted. I've just seen there, there's an overwhelming wash of cold lighting. So there's barely a wasted sentence in this particular extract. Again, same big writing as before, um, but this was a top level response. This was a sound designer for Machinal. As a sound designer, I would. And then again, we've got some subject specific terminology to sound, pre recorded non diegetic sound, um, white noise sound or metallic clanking, soundscape. And in the green, this is the impact or the effect that that particular sound choice is going to make. And finally for this one, we've got Equus. Lighting choices, decisions, choice, choice. What this candidate has done is um, it's slightly different terminology. They've talked about decisions and choices, but actually that's it's their decisions, their choices. So if you read the first line, Another lighting choice would be to switch. That's another way of saying, as a lighting designer, I would switch. So that's absolutely fine. But in the pink, this is what they would be doing with the lights. And you can see there, there's a whole load of um, subject specific terminology. They understand how they are going to light this scene. They also, of course, it's just flashed up in front of me, are alluding to other scenes um, from the rest of the play, which is critical to success as well. But we've got illuminate, crossfade, blackout, 75% intensity, intelligent profile light, snap fade, and so on and so forth. So you see in a very short space of time that there's a confidence about this response. And it's that confidence that very quickly begins to tell the examiner that this candidate has done the research and they know what they are trying to achieve. So we move on to section C, interpreting a performance text. The nutshell on this is, how would the student direct one of the nine available texts? Delightfully simple, but that's the essence of it. They are a director and they're going to direct one of these texts. There are lots of other demands, of course. Uh, make sure they've had plenty of opportunities to direct some work. You can be doing this right from component one, a little bit more sensitive with component two if they're directing um, their peers. But particularly when you're working on your section C text, make sure that they've all had experience of being a director and taking charge of one of these nine texts. Remember, they've got to be clean copies that they take into the examination room with them. Um, particularly if you're doing any of the three texts from our legacy paper, so Faustus, Lysistrata or Wojciech, um, I would use the downloads from the Pearson website. They're a great way to work through it. Uh, one of these eight practitioners uh, must be used. It can't be the same one that you've used for component one. Sadly, since 2016, knee-high as such don't exist, but this is true of most of them. You know, that um, Brecht, for example, Stanislavski, are long gone, but it's about understanding their style. And um, so, for example, for knee-high, what we saw a lot in 2023 was candidates were starting to talk about Emma Rice, for example. But again, we knew that by Emma Rice, it, it was all rolled in that they it was knee high style that they'd chosen. Can't emphasize enough that many, many demands that this section makes, there are so many things that need to be pulled in to get that top level response. So first and foremost, they have to understand what a director does. And it is amazing the number of them who don't actually know what a director does or they've got a slightly skewed idea as to what they think a director does. They need to understand the social, historical and cultural context, including the original performance conditions. They need to be able to make creative decisions and theatrical choices. 
develop a complete comp production concept and interpretation, know how to communicate to an audience, and appreciate how the practitioner theory and practice will inform their production concept. So I've wished through those, but they are big demands. And if they are really going to aim for those top band responses, they do need to understand these demands and be able to execute them and write about them in a knowledgeable way. So the flip side of that is simplicity. Don't let your students overcomplicate um, the demands of this question with concepts that require an in-depth explanation. Don't let them have a concept where every time they come to talk about it, they have to explain what it is. Have lots and lots of those, um, particularly where they've changed the gender of the character. So every time they talk about that character, they have to say, but in my concept, they are being played by, and so on and so forth. It just, they haven't got time in an exam. It's key that they respect and acknowledge the playwright's intentions. And none of these nine plays were meant to be staged in ridiculous settings. We've had some that have been set on the moon, in a submarine, in the Wild West, in a trampoline park, a hairdresser's, etc. And although they sound quite witty, and you might say, well, why not? It just overcomplicates it. It just makes it. And let's be honest, why would any of these be set in a trampoline park? Um, it, it's a recipe for disaster in more ways than one. But these are real examples that I've used here, but they really do show that there are moments when the integrity of both play and the playwright's intentions have been lost. So there are no marks for originality. They don't have to be super clever. They don't have to think, I'll be so original and witty and set it somewhere that nobody else has thought of. It rarely works in their favour. There are no marks for originality. It's an examination with specific assessment of criteria. And I know that can sound a bit dull, but that's where we are and that's what it is. And at the end of the day, you and your students want to get the best possible mark. So we're going to look at seven or eight examples. Again, they're taken from responses that were all sophisticated and scored very highly. So let's have a look at this one where they we're going to do the Tempest. So we've got words here like, as a designer, I will, straight away, it's referencing the original performance conditions at Blackfriars. It's talking about the extract, so it's focusing on the extract. Then we have specific references to scenes. We know that their practitioner is knee-high. That's mentioned very, very quickly, and it's in the bottom bit there. I had to stick two pages together. And it's taking account of audience impact reading four lines up from the bottom. An audience would find this comedic, which is a knee-high methodology to use exaggerated symbolic costume. They're obviously going to talk about Prospero there, um, but again, time and space had to just try and fit in as much as we can here. But if I'd highlighted this, it's you can see very quickly that it's fairly dense and that it's packed. Um, next one, School for Scandal, got a tight response here. Um, this candidate's chosen to talk about Emma Rice, you can see that in the first line, but that's taken to mean Nehi, who were mentioned earlier on. So we've got references about the practitioner and actually some an example from a previous piece that they'd done, which was really nice. That's, you can get that because it's contemporary. Then we go straight into OPC details. They're talking about the wig, the heels on the shoes. Then they're referencing my concept. And we go into some detail. For example, so I'm six, seven lines down. My production would combine modern and antique costumes. 
and then they go on to talk about Lady Teasel and we've got details about her costume which she struggles to walk in and the sort of bag she'd be carrying so that they're creating this whole package really. We go back to a quote from the extract, I hope you haven't been quarrelling, that can be a really nice way to use some quotes from the extract to again structure your response bearing in mind it's not just the extract and this particular bit on this page we have some detail about the wig and then um, in the brackets three lines up from the bottom they go on to talk about other parts of the play which we learn about in act one in act two scene one etc so referencing other parts of the play very very important and real trademark of a top level response by sister to here um, one of our most popular texts first line as a director of aristophanes Lysistrata, i would so straight away they're putting themselves in the role of a director instantly we know which play they've done and which question i would aim to effectively combine design elements so that was one of the questions of the two questions on the 2023 paper so by putting it in the body of their question it's demonstrating that they've got it they're demonstrating it but also of course it keeps them completely on track um, we we'll go straight into a mention of the OPC originally performed in 411 BC Brecht's their practitioner so we get to Brecht quite quickly the idea was shared with theatre practitioner Bertolt Brecht who utilised the V effect um, it neatly links these elements and it focuses on the extract. They then go back to referencing the fact they do it in the Olivier and this is likened to the amphitheatre Epidaurus and they use the word homage to the OPC. That's, that word came um, up um, three lines up from the bottom there, paying homage to the OPC. That came up more and more. That was top level responses, respecting, including, pulling in references, comparisons, connectors to the OPC. So again, we've only got, I know it's tight, so it's, there's more here, but even in this bit from a tight response, all the bases are covered. It's like a blanket where all the parts are neatly sewn in together. Dr. Faustus, again one of our carryover texts, not done that often anymore, but within this we've got focus on the extract, starts off with, and um, we're talking about design element, it's I wish to use this as lighting to reflect the opportunity Faustus has for redemption. This has got a confidence about it, it's talking about Marlowe, she's obviously referencing the OPC and those links um, connecting it to the audience so this will communicate to the audience how ignorant Faustus is to the chance of redemption he is given thus furthering Marlowe's key concept of the hubris of man so again it's got an air about it that you know it's going to go in the right direction if it carries on in this vein um, not quite finally, Antigone. So again, tight response here to Antigone. In my set design, I will use Brecht's significance in every element of theatre having a purpose. I will follow the original performance conditions by using an amphitheatre stage, however, adding in a revolving circle. And again, I'm not going to read this all, but we've got Brecht, OPC, the detail of the set, it's connected to Niger, which is a sort of modern equivalent of the concept, um, didactic acknowledgements, lots of lovely details on the set, the sand, it's dirty, scuffs of blood, and, and what that shows, particularly with Antigone's costume, the detail is related to her relationship with Creon. The impact on the audience is considered, which is crucial, and again, an understanding of how it's followed Brecht's method of creating theatre. 
So you've got a confident, knowledgeable, perceptive response in the little bit that you can read here. Keeping moving, voice check, hugely popular text. I've kind of married together three bits here. It might just have been the way it came on the paper. So we set off again with the extract being given. It gives us a context. Practitioner is punch drunk. We've got set detail given and the rationale for that scene. In my production, I would adapt this scene to be just outside the woods rather than beyond and, and goes on to tell us why. It goes on to explain how punch drunk would use this type of set. Um, we then go back to set details connected back to the OPC, which is important. We've got other scenes that are referenced and an awareness of the audience. Detail set compared to the OPC again. So these are here for you to read and have a look at later on and see that all these elements are pulled in very, very neatly, although each candidate is working individually and slightly differently. Finally, an extract here from a response that was written to Hedda. As a director, so obviously at the start of the question, I would choose to use Stanislavski methodologies in order to effectively highlight characterization, which was the question, as well as communicate key themes and ideas on stage. And then of course it goes on to say, particular things about Stanislavski, the opening sentences summarise their intention. We've got quite a bit of detail there on the original staging in 1891, and that's contrasted to a modern setting. I would make a switch to modern furniture. The choice to switch to a contemporary setting would be done. And again, they go on to explain why they're doing that. We've got some really interesting detail about the painting which becomes a photograph and how it's taken from the original intention to their modern um, depiction and details here again about the set which connects to the OPC. So there's a lot of detail in this one, but there's this toing and froing between OPC and, and their modern concept. So, all these extracts demonstrate how much detailed and densely packed information is required to cover all those bases. You know, there's no time for retelling the plot. There's no time for telling us about, um, you know, Breck's family or anything like that. They're all sharply focused on the demands of these questions. And every one of the responses that I've used here was not hugely different. The concept was not ludicrous. It wasn't ridiculous. Um, it was theatrical and possible to be staged and arose from the text as originally written and its intentions. In summary, from the 2023 examiner's report, um, can't emphasise enough the value of seeing live theatre for section A. And for sections B and C, the element that was missing the most was referencing the rest of the play and not just the extract. It was a real indicator of a top level response when there were numerous connections, references, comparisons, contrasts to other aspects of the play, not just in the extract. Component three resources, like there we've got the 15 set text guides and practitioner guides. There are now seven past papers available. So again, those patterns um, are becoming evident. Seven examiner's reports, the FAQs and other events and training. And there are lots of examples there. Um, I admit some are better than others. Um, Covering a range of text is far more problematic than you might think, and I've tried my absolute best to pull them all in here, um, but it's, it's just a case of what we pull up from the system 
in terms of high score and responses because that's what people tell us they want to see. There's very little point of looking at something that didn't score very well. So this is what not to do when, of course, we're always encouraging our students, this is what you do need to do. So in conclusion, I do hope you found this useful. You've probably bitted in and out depending which bit you're doing at which time. Um, you might have used it for some kind of staff training event. You might have used bits of it with your students. But I do hope you found it useful. And I do wish you every success moving forwards for you and your candidates in 2024.